evening. I'm Jean Yeomans, the Adult Services Coordinator here at the Hedbridge Public Library, and thank you very much for coming to our program. Our guest this evening, Dennis McCann, is a former Janesville Gazette and Milwaukee Journal, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel uh, writer. Dennis is the author of The Wisconsin Story, 150 Stories, 150 Years. Dennis McCann takes you for a ride, and Rough Stuff a collection of his columns from Wisconsin Golfer Magazine. His latest book, Badger Boneyards, The Eternal Rest of the Story, is a collection of stories about Wisconsin people, places, and trivia, all involving cemeteries in some way. Three years ago, after retiring, Dennis and his wife moved to Bayfield. They've been enjoying their new life along the shores of Lake Superior, and we are very happy to have Dennis here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Dennis back to Janesville and to the Hedger Public Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm pleased to be here tonight, um, partly because if we were back home in Bayfield tonight, we probably wouldn't have power, um, <laughs> from what I understand. This is sort of Edmund Fitzgerald weather up there, and uh, the, the lake has been bouncing pretty good. They had to stop running the island ferry, so. It's a little more safe and secure inside a library, and so I'm here tonight tonight. We're gonna to talk about cemeteries. Um, three years ago when I left the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, I was uh, invited to lunch by the publisher of the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, who knew of my interest in Wisconsin and history and, and uh, previous books, and she said, um, do you have any book ideas that we might be interested in publishing? And I said, well, you know, I've always wanted to write a book called Badger Boneyards, The Eternal Rest of the Story. And she just had this startled look on her face because that obviously wasn't what she was expecting to, to hear. But I, I'd had that interest and I had the title in mind and, and so I kind of explained to her what I was talking about, just a series of stories that all involve a cemetery in some way. And she said, well, turn in a proposal and a couple of sample chapters. And uh, a few months later, I hadn't heard anything and I thought, well, it was worth a try. And uh, suddenly the phone rang one day and she said, we'd like to publish your book. And I said, great, I better go write it. So for the next year, I went out and uh, spent much of the year in cemeteries and, and uh, wrote the stories and went through the editing process. And the book was published this year and, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do. But people are always saying, you know, why cemeteries? And that's the question I tried to answer in the preface to the book. Some years ago, while in Atlanta, an important newspaper business, and yes, there is such a thing still, I noticed in a visitor guide that the greatest amateur golfer ever, Bobby Jones, was buried in historic Oakland Cemetery. This interested me for two reasons. One, I play golf. Jones, in addition to his spectacular playing career, founded the Masters Golf Tournament, which is played each year at Augusta National Golf Club in Georgia. He was an iconic figure in the game. And two, on another occasion, some friends and I had once spent an afternoon trying quite unsuccessfully to find the Atlanta house where Jones had lived. I told Dale, the photographer I was with at the time, that we had to add Oakland Cemetery to our itinerary. Dale was not a golfer. He looked at me as if the fever had claimed my mind. It took two days to persuade him I was serious, but on our last day, he agreed we could swing through the cemetery on our way to the airport. And when we did, we found Jones's grave mowed short and tight as a putting green and graced with 18 specimens of plants, one for each hole of Augusta National Golf Course. Well, Dale was less than reverent. Instead of a hole in one, he said, he's the one in a hole. <laughs> I briefly paid respects. On top of housing the grave of Robert Jones, Oakland was a spectacular cemetery, a quiet city of some 70,000 residents, with sections for Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers, a potter's field with 17,000 graves, a section for former slaves, a Jewish section, and even a marker for Tweet the Mockingbird. There was so much grand Victorian funerary architecture as to put Oakland Cemetery on the National Register of Historic Places. On the way out, I saw a sign pointing to the grave of Margaret Mitchell of Gone with the Wind fame and asked Dale if we shouldn't stop there as well. Frankly, he said, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I forgave him that, but I surely didn't agree. Cemeteries have long held interest for me, which may be odd given my intention one day to be cremated, and nice coincidence here, gone with the wind myself. <laughs> Maybe this interest stems from my college years, when I sometimes mowed grass in a small cemetery in a town settled by Norwegian immigrants. Amid row after row of stones with Norwegian names was a marker for one lonely Irishman named Louis Kelly, 
an oddity I wove into a newspaper column years later when I discovered Shamrock, Wisconsin. As a traveling newspaper man, I often found stories in cemeteries the way political reporters find them at City Hall or sports reporters find them in a gym. In Taos, New Mexico, I stood at the grave of Kit Carson, whose frontier exploits had intrigued me as a child. In Key West, I went early one morning to the historic cemetery where the dead are buried both above and below ground to see the monument to the USS Maine and the famous headstone of B.P. Pearl Roberts, who was said to have been a hypochondriac. Her husband ordered a marker that read, I told you I was sick. <laughs> In Savannah, Georgia, visiting Bonaventure Cemetery was as much a must do as trying the southern specialty called she crab soup, and it's hard to say which I savored more. Bonaventure is the gorgeous atmospheric burial place my, made wildly famous in John Barron's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. But it had been discovered long before that. John Muir, after camping five days there in 1867, declared it so beautiful that almost any sensible person would choose to dwell here with the dead rather than with the lazy, disorderly living. It might sound funny to say the dead have inspired a lot of stories for me, but it's true. In Benton, Wisconsin, in the lead mine region, I once stopped at the grave of the celebrated pioneer priest, Father Samuel Mazzucchelli, whose Italian name was said to have so challenged the Irish nuns with whom he worked that they father, called him Father Matthew Kelly instead. In a little cemetery in the town of Scandinavia, I once tried to count the number of Nelsons under grass, but I gave up when I couldn't find a story in that. In New Diggins, the name refers to digging for lead and not for graves. I walked through the old Masonic Cemetery, said to be the first Masonic burial yard in Wisconsin, and a reminder that rights mattered, even in the state's rugged early days. In Michigan's Upper Peninsula, I spent an afternoon poking through Irish Hollow Cemetery, where it occurred to me that the cemetery that survives a ghost town must be doubly haunted. And one of my favorite newspapers ever, and I'll tell it later on in the story, also came from a cemetery in that Michigan country. There are thousands of cemeteries in Wisconsin, large and small, tidy and neglected, so old the headstones can't tell their stories, and so new that the ground is still wet from the tears of mourners. For every sprawling city of the dead, such as Milwaukee's Forest Home Cemetery, with more than 100,000 burials, there is a bedroom-sized plot on a country road. In either case, and in every cemetery in between, wherever the dead rest, history lives. I was kind of surprised when I started working on the book and I was doing some, um, some research, and I was able to secure every column that I ever wrote at the newspaper that involved the cemetery, and I was really surprised myself at how many that, that turned out to be. Uh, I th it might have started a little more in earnest when I did a book on Wisconsin history, because history is found in cemeteries as much as it is in museums and libraries. And so I must have at some point become associated with it too, because readers would send me tips about various places I should go, and often they would involve cemeteries. Uh, one year, I was always kind of dreaming up these scams so I could get out of the office during the summer. One year, I came up with this idea of traveling around Wisconsin using the, the road closest to the border all the way around. And someone who knew I was going to be doing that sent me a note and said, when you get to the very tip of northern Wisconsin, here's a guy you got to see. And that led to one of the stories that's in this book. It's called An Old Time Cemetery Man. This story comes from Norway, Michigan, about six feet over the Wisconsin-Michigan border but no artificial boundary should get in the way of a good cemetery tale. Someone once told me when I got to this area, I should slip across the border and visit Digger. Digger is really Ed Wenzel, but also called Billy. He was 76 when we met in the early 1990s, and he might truly be called the last of a dying breed, a small town sexton who knows where the bodies are buried because he buried them. When I called to say I was coming, I was struck by Digger's distinctive UP accent so I bought a tape recorder that night and took it with me the next day. Digger was wearing a cap and work clothes, but with no immediate need to arrange for another permanent lodger, he had time to show me around the piney setting where he worked. I'd been told to ask Digger about the old days, so I did. And Digger just started talking. 1937, April the 1st, 1937. When I walked up here the first day, it was really like a son of a gun. You had to walk four miles. There were no cars them days. There was no building, nothing, just a little old shed down in a hole. They had a wheelbarrow, a shovel, and a rake. That's all they had. Steel wheel, too. You had to dig everything by hand and then wheel everything <laughs> to the woods by wheelbarrows because there's half the grave left over. Anybody with common sense knows that. Like I said, you had no place to eat, no shed, 30 below. You had to come out and dig. You had to shovel the snow by hand, no snow blow, all with a scoop shovel. Then I started to plow with a truck without no door. That's how I froze my face. 
I got a dollar and a half a day, and then the other guys got a dollar and a quarter. I got a quarter more because I took the foreman's job. I did it all. I kept the books, the whole damn thing. And I was never a bookkeeper. I was a grave digger. And I told them that. Now I get, well, a guy shouldn't put salaries in there. We only get $325 here for digging a grave. They get six and 800 in Iron Mountain. See, we don't have no backhoe. We could have one, but to me, it don't seem feasible. It's only sand, you know. We dig them all by hand. A Couple of hours in the sand and we dig a hole. And one hour after we're done, you couldn't even tell where he was buried. We dig them all year round. I dug it 30 below. You got to pound with a hammer and maul and dig them. When you're young, you can go like heck. Like I said, it's just sand. But like I said, it ain't easy. And I hate to say it, but if I hadn't never stayed here, they wouldn't have the cemetery like it is. I don't want to brag about myself, but I know because I keep it up like I keep my yard at home. But I'm only one man and I'm getting older. I can't cut the mustard like I used to because I fell off the roof five years ago and about killed myself. My wife rolled me over and I heard her long miles away saying, Eddie, your father's gone, I think. I think your father is gone. Go call the ambulance. I think your poor old father is dead. But then I started to roll a bit. She said, Lord Almighty, he's starting to move. <laughs> a woman the other day said, I never thought you'd be back digging holes again. You were pretty well battered. I broke my arm and my collarbone and my pelvis, but I got out of the damn bed and came back and dug again. You got to be a cemetery man. You got to be dedicated. You got to go with the weather. When there's snow, you know, or a god darn rainstorm, you got to be out there. You got to get that thing in the ground. If the man says the funeral is 10 o'clock Tuesday, it's 10 o'clock Tuesday. Even though you are dead, you are on time. We sat for a while in the sexton's office where large historic photographs served as decor. Oh yeah, all the miners from that top picture up there, I buried the whole damn bunch of them. Even the widows now, because that's 55 years now, don't forget. See, all these younger guys, this kid will be in here in a little while. Funny he ain't here already. They're dead, all these guys. My mother, my father, my brothers, I dug my mother's on a Sunday. I dug all my relations, too. It never bothered me. Yesterday, I buried my classmate. When someone calls up and says, so-and-so's dead, you feel kind of funny. You get used to it like anything else. Years ago, I'd done all the digging, but now I get my son, Eddie, and them kids. They like it, you know? But I know the day I'm gone, when I walk out of here, they're going to go mechanized. I know they are. <laughs> we drove through the cemetery where I met a host of dead people. The first grave I dug was right there, Billy would say, a man at peace with his accomplishment. He is at home here, and like a good cemetery man, he has planned ahead. His stone is in place, and he knows who will open the earth to receive him. Eddie, he said, like father, like son. I always have enjoyed that story just because he was such a genuine person and was able to so matter-of-factly describe what his job was like. And it, there's, I, I tried to get some variety in here. Some of these stories are about very famous people. The picture on the cover is the grave of Frederick Pabst of the Brewing Camp family in Milwaukee. But it's also little people uh, that you might other, never otherwise come across, like uh, Digger and some of the others in here that I think kind of balanced it all out. Um, I did do a story about the cemetery in Milwaukee, Forest Home Cemetery is the largest in Wisconsin with 110,000 people or so. And the Pabst and the Schlitz and uh, the, the Blatz family are all there. They're buried in a section of the cemetery called Brewer's Corner. And they're all buried together, almost, uh, well, certainly by design. But uh, there was a period in uh, the cemetery history where people would compete for the size of their markers or mausoleums. And Val Blatz got the largest mausoleum in the entire cemetery. And he's looking down on the Pabst family. And you just sort of imagine, and he felt like he got the last word. They might have sold more beer than he did, but he, he got the bigger mausoleum. Uh, my friend John Gerda, who wrote the history of that cemetery, also points out that there are a lot more ordinary people in there who drank Pabst and Schlitz than whoever got famous or rich by making it. And never forget that about that cemetery as well. It's a wonderful place to go and take a walk if you're ever in Milwaukee, just because of the history there, the number of famous people you'll recognize. They call it Historic Forest Home, and they actually have a museum on the property with uh, uh, little displays about all the famous people, Harley Davidson, Alice Chalmers, the Brewing families, all of the governors and mayors that are buried there, and generals, um, on and on. It's, it's really quite a, it's more of a park and a museum than it is uh, just a cemetery, which is kind of nice. Some of the other stories um, are quite different. I, um, one of my, I have sort of a one-man campaign for people to have more fun with their stones or put more information on markers because it's, uh, when you walk through a cemetery, you don't always know what stories are involved. <laughs> one of these stories is about uh, Washburn, Wisconsin, up 
near where I live. There's a marker in the cemetery for a man named Tom Blake, which gives his dates and the fact that he was in the Navy. And there's no indication on the marker that he was among the best surfers the world has ever known. He grew up in Washburn on Lake Superior, left Washburn in 1918 when the influenza epidemic came along. He had to get out of there. And he went to Detroit, and he, was, uh, he had an opportunity to meet Duke Kahanamoka, the great Hawaiian surfer. Um, and uh, Blake became sort of captivated by this whole idea. And he went to California. He was quite an athlete, and he became a champion swimmer. And he was a stunt double in movies. He would be a stunt double for Johnny Weissmiller and others because he could swim like nobody's business. And, and he really wasn't taken by the acting business. He had to wrestle a dead shark in one movie, and he didn't like that at all. But then he went, made his way to Hawaii and lived for a while with Duke Kahanamoka and learned to surf the longboards. He invented a camera that would take photographs underwater and it was used for National Geographic and other publications. He invented a hollow core surfboard that sort of revolutionized that, that aspect of surfing. And he uh, was quite a fixture on Waikiki Beach and surf circles until he finally kind of soured of the changes there with tourism and came back to Washburn. But it just seems it's, it's a little bit of a loss that you have walked through the cemetery and see his name and not know a little bit of the story of this guy who uh, really stands out from everyone else in, this, in that same cemetery for what he accomplished. Another one of the stories in here is uh, from Bayfield, where in 1942, there was a terrible flood, just a, an outrageous amount of water fell in a hurry. And Bayfield, if you've ever been there, is all on a hill. And the cemetery is white at the top, quite a large cemetery, the, the Catholic cemetery on one side of the road and another community <laughs> cemetery across the road. And a part of the community cemetery let loose when the floodwaters came through. Graves opened up, boxes slid down the hill, bodies came out of the boxes. Uh, it was. Uh, quite gruesome, as you'd expect. The town was severely damaged by this, but the most emotional loss for a lot of people was that the cemetery uh, did not preserve their families as the way they thought they should. It took weeks for a, a panel of undertakers and volunteers, led by the fire chief, to go up and put everybody back that they could identify and take the last dozen or so and put them in a mass grave, uh, unmarked this time, because they were not able to know who was who and where they belonged. But uh, years later, Ed Erickson, the former fire chief, did a series of oral interviews, uh, sort of an oral history project, and he described some of the things that they did in the attempting to recover the bodies. He discovered uh, a woman's leg wearing only a nylon stocking, and uh, he noticed that there was not a run in that stocking. <laughs> and they found a man who was wearing only a green necktie. And he said, it must have been an Irishman. <laughs> but they weren't missing an Irishman, so they didn't know who he was, and he wound up in the mass grave. Uh, three or four years ago, there was a street project in Bayfield, and they found some human bones. And anywhere else, that'd be a big fuss. You'd have to go and stop the project and find out where they belonged. And uh, because they knew about this flood 60 years ago, they were able to say, no, they just go back up to the hill and, and uh, take them up there. So it's uh, the cemetery that didn't stay in place. It's not, it's not what you expect out of the permanency of the grave. Uh, I think the shortest story in here also um, is, is a little bit different. It's in Medford, Wisconsin, where the tombstone pizza was invented. Uh, there was a bar there called the Tombstone Tap, and it was named the Tombstone Tap because it was next to the cemetery. There was, the neighborhood was a cemetery neighborhood. So one Sunday afternoon in the 1960s, the owner, one of the co-owners, Pep Simek, was working, tending bar. And he served himself a little bit, and he started dancing the peppermint twist. And his wife told him to sit down before he fell down, and he fell down before he sat down and broke his leg. So he was in the kitchen recuperating, started working on pizza recipes, and created this pizza that they began to serve called the Tombstone Tap Pizza. And it became so popular that it was, uh, they started selling it at other places, and they shortened the name to Tombstone Pizza because of the cemetery across the street. Uh, Years later, they sold the company to Kraft for millions of dollars. And Kraft had an ad campaign that showed a man on death row. And they asked the man, what do you want on your tombstone? And he says, pepperoni and onions. <laughs> and Pep was, he was bothered that they were associating his pride and joy with death row. It did pretty well for Kraft. Um, I mentioned that readers used to send me some ideas for stories. Here's another one that uh, uh, came about the same way as soon as I can find it here. This is called Catherine Murdered by William. 
It comes from North Andover, Wisconsin. It was my fault that a day that had started so slowly should turn so hell-bent for leather. At first the sun was high and time my friend. A few breaths later it was late afternoon and lack, not for lack of searching, I still hadn't found Catherine Jordan. It was the goat's fault. I'd left home plenty early to reach this little corner of southwestern Wisconsin where I had heard that Catherine Jordan was buried. I made such good time along the way that I decided to waste some. When I got to Fenimore and found a livestock auction underway, I decided to stop and see what was selling. Goats were, 36 little dairy goats in the first lot. If anybody wanted a project to take home, the auctioneer had said, this is it. Real livestock men would have snickered, but I found the goats cute as all get out, just bleeding and blatting as they bumped around the ring. Not so cute as to inspire my hand to go up, though. I've done dumb things at an auction. Who hasn't? But even I knew if I drove off with 36 dairy goats bleeding in the back seat of my company car, I'd get home with the biggest case of buyer's remorse since the last, bu last guy bought a gremlin. So I sat on my hands. It's a scientific fact that your head itches more when it's not safe to scratch it. Through the sale of sheep and goats, a wonderfully whiskered old ram, a few calves, and finally a pig that looked so much like Babe the movie pig, I decided it was time to go. So I headed up the road to Boscobel before I finally checked map over memory and saw I was heading in the wrong direction, then turned south again along the Wisconsin River, enjoying the bright sun and keeping an eye out for turkeys. Where the Kickapoo meets the Wisconsin, I saw an eagle, a big one, a tree on the opposite bank. Eventually, the eagle lifted off and flew lazily away. You'll seldom see a turkey do that. When I came across a small flock a few miles later, they just wobbled heavily toward cover, and I looked out at the horizon, broken only by silos and steeples. And cemeteries, right. So I pushed on and soon reached North Andover, where a letter writer had told me I would find the grave of Catherine Jordan and add a touch of intrigue to your day. So far, the intrigue was that I couldn't find it, and I really wanted to, because the story, and yes, this is what you've waited through since the longest buildup since the Old Testament, is a good one. Her grave marker is said to be the only one in Wisconsin that gives murderers the cause of death and names the murderer to boot. But as small a town as North Andover is, I couldn't find the grave. I drove up First Street and down Second Street, traveled along Canal Street and Main Street, and then ran clean out of streets. North Andover had never grown to need more. So I started driving country roads that led off like spokes, looking only for the landmarks I knew of, a white marble stone in a small cemetery with a fence and gate. On Oak Road, I found a cemetery with a fence and gate, but no Catherine. In the midst of my futility, I at least found diversion. Eagles were everywhere now, having come over from the Mississippi River to scour for roadkill or dead baby pigs discarded by farmers. We all like to think eagles are noble hunters, one man said when I stopped his tractor to ask for help but they like their food dead and ready to eat just like the rest of us. <laughs> Time was wasting, so I asked at the lumber yard as well, to no avail. I stopped at strangers' houses and asked, to no avail again. One person told me that a man who wrote a book on North Andover, I'm guessing it's just one volume, might know, but he didn't live there anymore. And I was about ready to give up and head home when I did what I should have done at the start. I went to the tavern, bingo. Bartender Mary Mergen knew just what I was talking about. So I followed her directions and a few minutes and miles later found Ramsey Cemetery, where even before I got out of the car, I could see the name Jordan on a marker in the back. All these days later, it was still chilling to read the deed etched in stone. In memory of Catherine Jordan, murdered by William Kidd, June 15, 1868, aged 21 years, three months, six days. The story had been passed on through the years and occasionally made the papers, which explained the clipping my reader friend had, sent, had found and kept for maybe 40 years before passing it along. As it goes, Kid, he was not Billy but William, and Jordan were from pioneer families in North Andover and eventually courted. Kid was supposedly hot for marriage, but Jordan was not. On the night of June 15, 1868, she went for a buggy ride with Kid. The next morning, she was found by the road a mile from her home with her throat slashed. Kid disappeared, which didn't stop a Lancaster Justice of the Peace and six jurors from declaring him guilty of murder. Later, Kid was taken into custody in another state, but while being returned to Wisconsin, he drank a vial of poison he had secretly brought along and died shortly after. Kid was said to have been buried in Lancaster, but it was too late to go and see his grave. I thought maybe someday when I pass through again, I'll stop and look for his marker too. It would be a good grisly bookend for Catherine's own sad one. And if I ever do, I will start at the tavern. Um, 
sometimes it was uh, looking for something that you know is in a cemetery proved a lot harder to, than, than just uh, finding accidental uh, discoveries that, that worked. There was a man in, the, in Richland County who worked for the newspaper there for a number of years, and he was into cemeteries in a big way. He spent five years visiting every one of the 90-some cemeteries in Richland County and writing long stories about each one. And it, he published these over a long series called Tales the Tombstones Tell. And so I thought as long as I was doing this, I should spend at least a day and go visit some of those same cemeteries that he wrote about. And I found uh, a number of things that, that he had found and written about. There was this, the marker for a man who had been killed by a whale and died at sea, but the family put a marker in Richland Center near his home. Uh, I found the three brothers all together who had died in the Civil War. And I found a number of the others that he, he mentioned, the cemetery where all of the Germans are buried in one direction and the Irish are buried in another direction, <laughs> just so that you remember you're different or something. I don't know exactly what that was. But I could not find the marker for the woman who, had, who weighed 450 pounds and listed her weight on her stone when she died. She apparently was quite proud of, of uh, having reached that milestone. But 50 years is a long time for some markers to survive, especially if they're old to begin with. And after a while, they do break and they disappear. But I really wanted to find that stone, and I was never able to do that. Um, um, there are others as well that, you know, sometimes you, you were certain that you, you were looking for one thing and you'd find something that was even better. And those were always good days, too. Uh, I was in La Crosse and, and uh, looking up something in the public library, and I read about some woman there and, and uh, just completely dropped whatever else I had gone there to do and spent the rest of the day looking for her and eventually wound up in a cemetery in McGregor, Iowa later that day where I found her family and I'll show that uh, in just a few minutes. We're going to go over uh, some of the photos now. This is uh, a cemetery near Spring Green, Wisconsin, uh, excuse me, near Sauk City, Wisconsin, Sauk Prairie. It's out in the country and uh, the cemetery was built to serve the needs of a community of free thinkers. This was a group that came over in Germany. It was a philosophy that was not necessarily uh, anti-religion, although a number of them were considered atheists, but they were very definitely anti-clerical. And when Andrew Roll, who was the, the property owner, donated the land for this cemetery, he declared that he would donate it under the grounds that no priest or minister ever set foot on the property. And, uh, the, the free thinkers, there used to be about 200 free thinker communities in, in the United States. Uh, this is the only one that survives, and it is still active today. It's quite a historic uh, meeting place in Sauk City. And they still use the cemetery. Those, uh, the names that you see there are prominent members of the, of the community. It's grown a little. It's now attached to the Unitarian Universalist Church movement. And uh, it, it's uh, got all sorts of, of a range of members. But the cemetery is still active. It's got magnificent pine trees that were brought in as saplings when they developed the cemetery. And now they've grown to be just, just uh, towering pines. Uh, if you're looking for cemeteries in the country, always look for evergreens of some kind, either arborvitas or pines, because they are very often uh, marked with those. That's, Pinewood is one of the most common cemetery names in Wisconsin, along with Greenwood and uh, Forest Home and other bucolic uh, titles. Uh, and I am told now that a minister has been in the cemetery sometimes. So. This was uh, in a cemetery in Door County. Um, it just sort of, uh, th there was a section of the cemetery where I suddenly realized that all of the markers were for children. And of course you get quite a different kind of, of stone for that. Uh, it turned out that it was a church and these children had not been baptized and so they couldn't be in consecrated ground. So they were buried separately at the edge of the cemetery. And uh, you know, you, a cemetery is not necessarily a sad place if you don't know people there, because for the most part, they're lives that were lived long, and you hope that they were lived well. But when you find yourself suddenly standing in the, the children's section, it makes a, a little bit of a different impression. This is uh, the White Star Church. It's called the White Star Psychic Science Church in Southern Door County. And I thought if you're going to commune with the dead, go to the place where the people believe in psychics and communing with the dead. This is still an active uh, church. This was a movement that uh, was popular in the 1800s, especially after the Civil War. And some Belgian soldiers who came back to Wisconsin from the Civil War brought back the belief in uh, psychic science. Um, Mrs. Lincoln uh, met with a psychic in the White House because she was trying to commune with her son who had died. 
And it was uh, quite a movement for a while. There were actually two communities in uh, Door County that had these. One of the communities uh, didn't do so well because one of the members uh, wanted to show how strong his faith was, and so he cut his hand off. And when he died, a lot of us, a lot of the other members of the community lost faith in their church if it didn't <laughs> save him. So that was a kind of a rash act. But the church has survived and is still in operation. Um, you can look at their website now, although if you're a real psychic, you probably wouldn't have to. But <laughs> they have two cemeteries. The first one was, um, it was thought not uh, the best ground for a cemetery because of high groundwater. So there's a few people buried there under a single marker. And then they have another cemetery on Cemetery Road. And I went there and tried to commune with the dead, but I heard absolutely nothing from anybody that day. <laughs> Oops. That's just an example of what they call funerary architecture. During the Victorian era especially, uh, they got really ornate with uh, the markers. As I mentioned, the competition in Milwaukee at Forest Home. Uh, the Victorian era, there's uh, a number of symbols were associated with stones. If you see a tree, a, a marker in the shape of a tree and it's cut off in the middle, it usually means that a man died in middle age. Uh, if the vines grow all the way up, it lived a long time. Uh, clasped, uh, the dove, of course, means it could be a child. Uh, it's just a, one of the delights of walking through a really big cemetery with a lot of this is trying to figure out what some of the subtle messages on some of the markers mean. This is perhaps my favorite photograph. This is uh, yet again in Door County at a church called Our, Our Lady of the Snow in a little Belgian town called Namur. And, uh, what happened was that the, the priest at the church in the, sometime in the 1970s decided they needed a parking lot. And he decided that the best place for the parking lot was where they already had a cemetery. So he picked up all of the stones from everybody who was buried in the cemetery and moved them to a little garden plot next to the church. He didn't move the bodies. He paved that over and made a parking lot. <laughs> but all of these guys are buried, are, have their stones here, and all about eight inches apart. So it looks like a cemetery for the world's smallest group of people. Um, there's a, whenever you get to a, an ethnic cemetery, uh, and there are many of them around Wisconsin, um, it's always fun to read the names because you get these real old world names that are in the cemetery. And a number of them, I don't know if you can see them very well, but they used porcelain photos of the person who was buried so that you can not only go and read the name and dates, but you can see uh, the person who was buried there. And sometimes it's kind of fun because they, in the style of that time, they're very severe poses, as if they knew where that photo was going to be someday. But uh, it's just one more way to kind of meet the people who are there. This is uh, in Walworth County. There's two stones right next to each other that really sort of caught my eye. I call them the talkative Cameron tombstones. The first one is for John Cameron. It's a man who died in 1946 at age 80. And he has the full terms of his pension from International Harvester printed on his marker. It says, pension certificate. This is to certify that John D. Cameron, upon retirement from active duty, has been awarded a pension in recognition of his long, faithful, and efficient service through a period of 41 years and one month. This certificate is not transferable or assignable. <laughs> and then it was signed by the company president from, uh, from uh, International Harvester. And what was really interesting was you. You, you sort of get the idea, but you don't know exactly why he put that on there. Uh, was, he, you know, was he proud of his 41 years and six months, or was he happy that he earned a pension that allowed him to live until 80, or did the pension take care of his wife? Just a real curious one. Well, then you move next door and you look at his son, Duncan. You can read a little bit of that. He uh, died in Chicago at age 24, and had graduated. He talks about the elementary school, the high school, and then he went to Ann Arbor to Michigan and uh, earned a Bachelor of Arts. And you think, well, that's a pretty good achievement for a man at 24. And you step around to the back of the grave, and they'd just been warming up. Then they, they started down the back as well. And they told about um, everything else he did in life, that he was a Boy Scout, a member of Delta Tau Delta fraternity, a member of the University of Michigan Union, Naval Reserve, assistant instructor, and on and on, right down to the bottom, even to the fact that he was the manager of the Michigan yearbook. And, and they must have had money because they didn't even abbreviate the University of Michigan. They paid the cutter to spell it out every time. <laughs> and you stand and read all of this and you think, why would they put all that on the stone? Well, he died at 24, so the, the obvious guess is that they felt like he's had an accomplished life even though he died young. And so they put all of the information on there. 
I contacted the, uh, the people in charge of the cemetery, and they were able to do a little research and show that he died of tuberculosis, which explains he was a veteran because there was a veteran star next to it. And I, at first I was thinking maybe he died of war-related injuries, but the date was wrong. And so it's one of those little mysteries that they, they reveal so much, but then they leave you to guess at the rest. And uh, so they're, they're very talkative, but they don't tell you the whole story. But it is uh, quite an unusual one. <laughs> Before I wrote this book, my favorite intersection in Wisconsin was near uh, Bonduel, and where you're going down the highway in a little community called Slab City, you can turn right onto Hope Lane or left onto Dump Road. And I always thought that was just sort of the perfect metaphor for life, and this might be the, the death end of the same situation here. The odd thing is that Cemetery Road, there was a large church on the road with a cemetery there, and they didn't name it Church Road, it's called Cemetery Road. This is the Eastman Cemetery in McGregor, Iowa. And this is named for a woman named Emma Eastman, who, this is the story that I found in uh, La Crosse. She was also named the Virgin M. And I said that she was named the Virgin M the way you have a great big guy and you call him Tiny, or a milk toast and you call him Butch, because she was married nine times. <laughs> I was at the library and I was reading about this beautiful woman and her nine husbands. And the story indicated in this, this history that she was buried in McGregor with six of her husbands around her. And I thought, that's pretty good achievement. So I, I got some research on Emma. She was the first woman to be, buried, uh, to be married in the city of La Crosse. But even by then, it was her fourth one. And uh, that didn't last a long time. She was quite a, a celebrated figure in town. She carried a pistol and wasn't afraid to use it. Uh, she shot her brother-in-law in a property dispute once, but her husband was in jail at the time. Uh, she had a, a, a habit of getting married more than she did divorcing. She wasn't always good on the legal niceties. She would just move on when she was ready. One of her husbands uh, wrote a letter to the court saying he wanted to divorce her for adultery. He, he felt like coming back and hanging her, but it would nasty up a perfectly good rope. <laughs> well, the truth is, when I, I got down to McGregor to find her, because I was just determined that I would find this woman and her six husbands, she's only buried with three of the husbands. The last three are there with her. Uh, the cemetery, I, I wasn't sure how to find it, because I didn't really know McGregor that well, so I did what I always do, and I went first to the library, and I thought, is anybody even going to know about this? And so I mentioned the name to the librarian, and she turned and pointed to a mural on the opposite wall. Uh, historic mural of the community. And there was uh, Emma Eastman with nine husbands buried around her and she's holding a little bit, you know, bouquet of flowers and crying a tear. And then she handed me a brochure for a Valentine's program that was coming up on the many loves of Emma Eastman uh, that they produced on there. So then she gave me the directions to the cemetery and I went out there and I contacted the man who has done a lot of research on her and written a small book about this cemetery because of Emma. And he said that if he had known her, He's not sure he would have liked her, but he did find her a really interesting character, and I'm pretty certain he would have married her, too, if he spent that much time. <laughs> this is the mass grave of fire victims at Peshtigo. Uh, one of the most historic spots in Wisconsin, when they started the Wisconsin Historic Highway Marker Program, the number one marker went to Peshtigo. Uh, more than 1,300 people died in that fire on the same day as the Chicago fire, got far less attention, of course. And um, came time to bury the dead, there were hundreds of people they couldn't identify. A lot of them had been men, work, single men working in the, the woods, living in dormitories. So there's more than 300 buried in this mass grave, and others are buried in the cemetery around there. There's a museum that tells uh, the story of the Peshtigo fire, but to really understand the impact, it's helpful to get out and walk around the cemetery. There are um, little interpretive signs at some of the, the graves that tell the stories of how those people died. And uh, even so many years later, some of them are really tragic stories. Uh, one man decided to save his family by hitching the wagon and taking off, but in his haste, he didn't hitch the wagon correctly. And he stopped to fix the, the hitch, and a ball of flame rolled over the wagon and killed everybody. And they have these stories. And um, It'll say on the, on the stone, it'll name a family, they say it all died in the conflagration, something like that. It's a pretty interesting piece of Wisconsin history. This is the grave of Frank Lloyd Wright in Spring Green. He's buried in Unity Chapel. He was in Arizona when he died in 1969, I believe it was. Um, 
And he was brought back to Wisconsin and buried near Taliesin at Unity Chapel. His mother is in the cemetery, and so was his, uh, the mistress who was murdered at Taliesin is there. He was buried there, and then the plan was that the woman he was married to at the time of his death would also be brought there when she was ready. Well, when, by the time she died, 25 years later, she wanted no part of Spring Green. She was pretty attached to Arizona. And it was her dying wish that Frank be dug up and brought to be with her. And so some of his followers came and basically wanted, they wanted to spirit his body away without anybody knowing about it. Because they knew that there would be an uproar. And uh, the story broke in the newspaper just the day that they were leaving town with his body. And there was an uproar. People called it grave robbing and said that Frank Lloyd Wright needed to be in the Wyoming Valley that had nursed his spirit. And, and uh, it was a terrible thing. And the legislature passed a resolution demanding the return of Frank Lloyd Wright to Wisconsin. And of course, the legislature was ignored then, as it often is today. But the marker is still there. And if you go to the cemetery, as we did, um, and as other people have, have told me, uh, you can go and you can uh, stand there and pay your respects, but you have to speak up because he's not there. And they won't tell you he's not there. They give tours of Frank Lloyd Wright in the area, and they don't mention as they go through the cemetery that uh, it's all a hoax at this point. This, <laughs> This is a cemetery in, uh, outside of Green Bay at Oneida. It's largely a Native American cemetery. And it's really a beautiful, beautiful spot out in the countryside. It's built on a hillside with stunning views. But some of the markers, many of the markers in this cemetery are more personalized than you might find elsewhere, uh, which makes it a much more interesting place to take a walk. But I do really like Roy Kenneth Metoxen for saying, Listen to me just once. <laughs> and again, you don't know exactly who he's saying that to, if it's to his kids or his wife or the government or something. He's getting the last word, and uh, he did it the hard way. <laughs> this is the grave of John William Heisman of the Heisman Trophy fame in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, which surprises a lot of people to learn that he's buried here. Uh, he's buried in the, his wife's, I believe it was his second wife's family plot. But what's a little bit surprising is that there is nothing to indicate that he's the famous John Heisman. It's just a flat marker on the ground, nothing to point the way to it. I had to ask for, for help in finding it. The um, people in Rhinelander generally know that he's there. And uh, there's a little museum exhibit at the airport to kind of tell about his, uh, his history and his contributions to the game of football, being the father of the forward pass and so much more. But uh, so far as is known, there's never been a Heisman Trophy winner who's come to visit the, the grave, even when Ron Dane won from Wisconsin. Somebody did once leave a mason jar with four football tickets on the grave, and the tickets went unused. Uh, then I found out they were for a Minnesota game, which explains all <laughs> <laughs> This is in uh, Peninsula State Park in Door County. There are actually three burial sites within the park boundaries at Peninsula. There was an old historic cemetery kind of hidden away at Weeborg Point with some of the pioneer uh, settlers from that area. There's the community cemetery at, uh, called Blossomburg Cemetery, which is a beautiful place, and it's right in the center of the park. A lot of people riding bikes will get off and take a walk around and, and look at that one. This is on the golf course at Peninsula, and it's, it marks the grave of Chief Simon Kekwados, who was a Potawatomi Indian leader. Uh, the Potawatomi had its ancestral connections to this, this area. He was a leader of his people. He negotiated on behalf of the Potawatomi with the federal government. And, and he was in Door County for some event, and someone asked him if he would like to be buried at that site. And he said, yes, he would. So when he died in poverty, his, his wish was granted. Uh, not right away, because Simon had the bad luck to die in winter. And Door County, being Door County, they wanted to make it a tourist event. So they kept him on ice for a while until spring came along and the cherry blossoms came out. And then they had a service for, for Simon. And it was quite a big deal. They had the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society people and uh, local historical society people and uh, a nice big turnout uh, for this the burial. And then a local uh, promoter up there said we need to have a totem pole. Totem poles have nothing to do with Potawatomi or Wisconsin Indians. But they put up a totem pole. This is now the third version but uh, he, he rests on the golf course right at the edge of one of the holes. And there's a marker there that reads, uh, pays tribute to a good and worthy Indian. And uh, the scorecard notes that if you hit your ball too close, you get relief from the totem pole. It's the only golf course I've ever seen that. This was uh, 
one of those moments you don't expect when you're walking through a cemetery. It's a relatively recent burial at the time that we were there. Um, my wife took most of these photographs, by the way. She's here tonight. Uh, we, we saw this with the legs, the, the braces leaning against the marker, with the shoes still in the leg braces. And you can, you can certainly guess that it meant something like, you know, I don't need these, in, these contraptions anymore or something, or maybe they got me this far, I'm good now, or whatever the message was. It was really unusual to see those uh, just leaning against the marker in the cemetery. This is in Wisconsin Dells, and this is the grave marker for Belle Boyd, the Confederate spy. She was quite a figure in the Civil War. She was uh, a young and beautiful woman, uh, a Southern woman, who used her, her womanly wiles, as they said, to get secrets from Northern officers and share them with the Southern uh, officers. She worked in a boarding house and would listen to the conversations of the Northern uh, leaders. She would once uh, gain fame for running across a battlefield and dress flying and, and uh, deliver Stonewall Jackson some information about when to send his troops. Uh, she was uh, arrested several times and, and uh, would sit and sing Confederate songs out the jail window. But after the war, uh, as it happened, she married three times and they were all Northerners. After the war, she became convinced of the cause of unity. And so she was doing a long speaking tour. And she got to Kilbourne City, giving her one woman program on the, the importance of national unity. She happened to be there when she died. It was called Kilbourne City before it was Wisconsin Dells. And so she was buried, and it's one of the very, very few places in Wisconsin you'll find a Confederate flag flying year round. For many years, for more than 50 years, in fact, there was a man there who every Memorial Day, at the request of the Daughters of the Confederacy from Virginia, he would raise the stars and bars along with the American flag. And a couple of years ago, to show their thanks, the women from Virginia came and uh, had a ceremony honoring him for honoring their memory. And in return, they put a wreath on uh, the grave of some soldiers from Wisconsin who died in Virginia and are buried there. But it's quite a, uh, it, again, it's one of those things when you're just walking through the cemetery and don't know the story, it really does jump out at you. So if you ever want to go to see Belle Boyd, she's there. There's also a cemetery in Madison where there are 140 Confederate soldiers buried who died at Camp Randall during the Civil War. It was a prison camp. And uh, they died and were buried in Madison. And um, to the section set off from the rest of Forest Hill Cemetery on the west side. And a, a woman came to Madison uh, many years after the Civil War, of course. And the cemetery for the Southern soldiers was kind of um, neglected. And so she took it on as her cause and tended to the graves of her boys, as she called them, for many years. And when she died, she was buried in a grave right in front of the Confederate section with a special marker honoring her for her, for her service to her boys. So. That is my talk for this evening, and I wanted to thank you for listening so nicely. If anybody does have any, thank you. If anybody does have any questions, we have a couple of minutes. Yes? This is uh, McGregor, Iowa. Uh, isn't that also uh, part of the Ringling Brothers history over there? Yes, it is. Are any of the Ringlings uh, buried there? Not to my knowledge. They lived there as boys, right? and uh, then moved on, and there's a lot of other cities that claim them. I don't know. The house that they grew up in, there's a sign in front that identifies it, but I, I don't know of any ringlets that are buried there. Yes? What can you tell us about the Dillon Beck Cemetery over on Highway 14? It's just a little... Somebody else asked me that in another talk today, and I don't know anything about it. Oh. I need to learn so that I can answer that question, though. Right in the middle of business. Well, what happens in a lot of places, um, you have a cemetery at the edge of town, and the town grows around it. Yeah. Uh, that's why if you go to a big city out of the east, for example, you'll find community cemeteries all over the place in town because mm -hmm. they were built at the edge at one time. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that's partially the explanation, but I just don't, don't know it's specifically. It's yeah. Yes? How did you choose the stories that you put in this book? Um, some of them I knew about and I just thought that they were good stories. And I also contacted people whose advice I value and said, if I do a book on cemeteries, what do I need to include? And uh, got a lot of ideas that way. Um, it was just a matter of you know, things that interested me for the most part. And I had one other question. Um, with Virgin M, uh, out of curiosity, do you know how many men she was married to at like one time in terms of all No, I, I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> That would have been in the 18, 
50s, 60s, so the records are probably a little bit inconclusive. But, yeah. Yes? Have you been to Barry, Vermont? I have, I have not. No. Uh, B-U-R-Y? The stones are just outstanding. Oh. They're so unusual. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. It's uh, Italian, uh, great uh, uh, carvers. Oh, okay. Are, are uh, situated real, there. Real craftsmen or something. They're, yeah. They're really neat ones. Yeah. Well, oh, good. I'll put it on the list. Yes. There's certainly lots of stories that you have found and are probably finding in your talks. Any thoughts of a sequel? I, I have said from right, to, right from the beginning that a sequel is going to be a lot easier because I keep hearing about more things all the time. Um, I don't know if, uh, what's going to happen. We'll see how this one does. But uh, there's, what I'm finding is there are a lot of people who have stories like this and are happy to share them. And there's a lot of people with an interest in cemeteries. Um, my immediate cause, and I may look for this on the way home on Friday, is um, I was talking to a stone cutter and asked him if he's ever really had any interesting ones. And he, not that he had done personally, but he knew of a cemetery near Fifefield, which is a small old lumber town. And uh, he said that the man that's buried in there has on his stone, uh, he relates how mean his first wife was and how much meaner his second wife was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he was the problem, but I do want to find that. I do want to find that stone. Yes? When you were uh, working, using your voice through um, Morris Stone. Mm -hmm. Did you come across that Newhall House? Yes. Thing? Yeah, there is a marker. This honors the, the victims of a fire at a rooming house, a hotel in Milwaukee. Uh, many of them were uh, young Irish immigrants who were working as maids, and I forget the total of the people who died. Quite a few. Yes, and there's, there's actually a marker for the Newhall victims in two different cemeteries in Milwaukee because they're not all buried under either marker. But it was such a significant chapter of local history that they put up uh, quite a, a large monument with the names of all the, the women who died in that fire. Um, there's a, in my, my family plot in Forest Home, there's an empty, two empty graves. Mm -hmm. And they represent one man and a cousin after, who was absolutely murdered by. They were on Jones Island, mm -hmm. and they were fishermen. He was out with his fishing boat, and he was deliberately run down. And there was a case about it in Racine or Canoli Racine, I think, and where the captain was actually uh, taken to jail and oh. tried. Anyway, then two years later, his son was washed overboard. Oh, so that's what those were. Yeah. Grades. Yeah, you hear a lot of stories about that. Uh, somebody in another talk this week told me about, in their community, some guy put up a really ornate marker. And it was to, he really wanted to be remembered well. And uh, apparently, uh, he's not buried there, but his wife is buried there with her next husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can only control things you're around to, to deal with yourself. Well, uh, Ted? Uh, the, so many of your references were to Civil War mm -hmm. individuals and monuments. I'm reminded <clears throat> in southern Indiana, uh, where my parents were from, there's a Baptist seminary out in the country, a cemetery out in the country, and there is a, a grave marker uh, to a Captain McCarthy. And it says across the bottom that he was murdered by six peace Democrats. <laughs> it seems that he was sent back to find deserters. Uh -huh. And uh, particularly in southern parts of Illinois, Indiana, and so on, there were a lot of people that were not sure. They were not in favor of the Civil War. And uh, there were that with these yeah. peace yeah. Democrats for some of them. Well, it, it does give you one last chance to get a kick in at somebody, you know. <laughs> so. Well, again, thank you all for coming, and I enjoyed it very much. I will be over there with some books if anybody wants to uh, take a look at some. Thank you.